Good evening, everyone. And amongst us, we have Dr. Neelima Barbade, who has already taken two sessions with us. And her knowledge on the contract law is as clear as a noon day. And that's why people watch her webinars as well as participate in the seminars. And above all, the most positive aspect I have seen is that her students who have studied at ILS just follow her up on the social media and they encourage her, not her, but to the people at large that they should watch and hear from her because they believe and whatever interaction I have had, I also feel that if you have to understand a contract, you will have to have a contract with her and contact with her to understand the different perspectives of law. And we've already done two sessions on the contract law series. And today is the legal perspective series, the litigation perspective as to what are the means and modes which have to be decided. As they say that if your contract is drafted in the right essence, with right nitty gritty, you will all nip the issues which could arise at a subsequent stage of time. As they say, the contract would have the essence of the words. One comma here or there, vowels difference at a different place, changes the entire essence, and which could actually lead to a different litigation. In a lighter vein, they have said that in the corruption case, there was a case wherein it was to be typed as that I had given him bribe, and it was written as I had given him bribe. The, they said that once you are a son-in-law, then what action could you intend to take against that person? So that typographical error of D and B changed the entire scenario. But be that as it may, we know that contract law has its own essence. We'll ask ma'am to share her knowledge. And we always, not only on beyond law, but people at large, intend to understand the nuances from her because she actually unlocks everything for the better understanding and better perspectives of law. Over to you, ma'am. A very yes. good evening to all. And uh, I am happy and I really thank Mr. Vikas Chatrat from the bottom of my heart. He has made me work. He has made me work to bring this, uh, the contract law to you from a different perspective. And I have enjoyed working on it. I'm also happy that uh, I'm able to bring my thoughts to many who are interested in hearing them. I think I have a very different way of looking at contract law. First the law, then the transacting, and then how you look at it from the litigation perspective. I have a little background of litigation before I joined academics. And I think that uh, that background enabled me to understand contract law in a different manner. Before I proceed ahead, uh, Vikasji, please confirm that you can hear me clearly. Yes, ma'am, perfect. Very good, thank you. I must first uh, put a disclaimer that I am not going to talk about law at all in the sense there will be no case law, there will be no interpretation of sections. Today's session is more about thinking. If I have a client who consults me about making a transaction, so I am wearing a transaction hat, or I have a client who has come to me between the contract while the contract is going, and asks me, what shall I do? Then I wear a consultant or an advisor's hat. And if after dispute has arisen, the client comes to me, then I don the litigator's hat. And how I think differently or how the, the, the approach to litigation affects my thinking while making the contract, while working through it, and while deciding whether to go in for litigation and on what type. I will be discussing with you with very, very simple examples. Most of my examples are about sellers and buyers dealing with goods because that is what I am easily familiar with and that is so easy to explain. So with this disclaimer that I'm not going to discuss any law, but I'm going to look at it as a method of thinking 
and ask you to look at law. So I'll be raising questions and perhaps not uh, giving any answers. And in that, in that sense, please forgive me if I am personally just now wearing my hat as a teacher rather than as a lawyer or a consultant. So contract law is such that parties enjoy freedom of contracting. They can decide how they will form it. They can decide the terms of performance, whether they will deliver goods first or they will pay first, what will be the price and so on. They can decide how long their relationship will last. Will it be for this transaction or will it be for one year or for 20 transactions? They can decide how the contract will come to an end and that will include, for example, termination clauses. In my earlier module on transaction, I have dealt with this in detail. So I just discussed the background. They, may, they can decide between themselves how subsequent events will affect them. And uh, they can also decide whether compensation will be payable, payable at all. For example, there are exclusion clauses or whether compensation will be limited, where we have limitation of liability clause. So these are the things which parties can freely decide. So what remains in the law then? And that brings me to this question, what is the role of contract law? Uh, please excuse me, I look by the side just to make sure that the screen has changed because I have it on my mobile as well. The contract law enables us to locate the contract. So if one party says, ah, we have a contract, and the other party says, no, no, there's no contract, we were just negotiating, then the contract law enables us to analyze and find out whether what they have, has it formed into a contract or not. Because parties are so free to decide, they may not decide on every aspect of the deal that will affect them. If they have not decided or agreed upon something or provided for some aspect of it in the contract, then the law provides a default rule. So if parties have not mentioned about delivery of goods, where they will be delivered, then the Sale of Goods Act says that goods are delivered where they are. So that is the default rule. Parties are free to decide otherwise. So most of contract law, that is the Contract Act, the Sale of Goods Act, and many other laws affecting special contracts, they generally mostly provide default rules. But the main role of contract law is to enable enforcement. Parties can make, or even parties who do not know that there exists some law can still make bargains. But why do they need the contract law? They need it because the contract law gives them the faith that if one party breaks it, then the other party can ask for relief. So the system provides a means of enforcement. And the contract law also provides for remedies. What happens if a contract breaks? What happens if a contract is completed but payment is not made? So these are the remedies and generally there is a remedy for an agreed amount or an agreed sum. There is compensation, specific performance and return of amount. So these remedies are what the law recognizes and it makes provision for them. I begin with this statement by an uh, academic, Andrew Tettenborn, who wrote in 1999 that legal advice is at bottom, simply advice as to the remedy likely to be available or unavailable to the client. And this legal advice may be given even at the stage of formation of contract. So when a lawyer advises to make a contract or make a provision in a certain manner, the advice actually is very closely connected with this question. If the contract were to be enforced, then what remedy will be available? Let us look at that because ultimately we are writing a contract so that it will get enforced. Hopefully, the deal will go through. Hopefully, the contract will be fully performed. But if there is a breach, then we should be able to 
properly drafted just now so that it is enforced in the manner my client wants. And that is why I say that whatever is the remedy structure, what the courts give us, what reliefs are available, when are they available, etc. It affects parties' conduct. It affects parties' conduct when they decide the terms, the primary terms. I put them in inverted comma because that is the terminology I use. The primary terms is what they have agreed to do under the contract to complete the transaction. Pay, deliver, provide services, give warranty and so on. Secondary terms is what if the first one is broken, then what? Will they be liquidated damages, which court will have jurisdiction, etc. So, what is the remedy will enable them to decide how we contract. So it's quite likely that parties may agree that, well, even if there is a breach, the liability will be limited to, say, 100 units or 100 rupees. That enables them to lower the price. So 100 rupees will be enforced, not more than that, even if the loss is higher. But because that is possible, that is why in the primary terms, they can agree that the price will be lower. Secondly, what is the remedy? Based on that, they will decide when to perform. What if there is a delay? What if I don't deliver just now, but after a few days? What if there's a late delivery? How does the other party respond to it? So during the performance, what they will do, somewhere they will have in mind what remedy is available. Then their diligence during performance. If at all they wish to negotiate for any changes, then what they should negotiate. And if at all there is a breach, then whether to file proceedings or not. All these aspects, well, they are governed by a thought as to what remedy will be available if the contract is to be enforced. So how do we proceed from the litigation perspective? First of all, we must know the contract. By that, I mean the nature of the contract. And by that, I mean the true nature of the contract. Is this an assignment or a license? Is this a lease or a license? Is this an agreement with a condition to repurchase or is it a mortgage by conditional sale? And for that, is this a pledge or is it a sale? To understand this, we must know the essential features of that transaction. And to understand that well, we must not only know the contract, but we must also know the business aspects of it. Because ultimately, if the matter went to court asking, is this an assignment or a license, it will get analyzed with reference to what is involved in the deal. So we should know how that transaction serves parties' interests. This is what I mean by the transaction and the contract and the nature of the contract. But not only that, as a lawyer, we must also very understand in great detail every term in that contract. So if I am to advise the client as to what is he, what, how he should go about a case to be filed on his behalf, then I should have read the entire contract. I should know the whole of it. Maybe I don't read every provision in detail, but I should be conscious of the types of provisions which we find in that, which I find in that contract. But not only that, we should also know the laws that are going to apply to that contract, and we will get to know more about it as we go ahead. As an example, we should know the law. So let me take this example. Section 39, effect of refusal of party to perform a promise fully. As we know, this is anticipatory breach. So the section goes like this, and I've only taken the relevant part. When a party to a contract has refused to perform his promise in its entirety, the promisee may put an end to the contract. This is an important part. He may put an end. What does this mean? So let us take an example. Under a contract, S, who is a seller, must deliver goods to B, who is the buyer, on 15th of December 2022, 
for a price of 5 lakhs. This is the contract. Now, before we proceed to the next slide, section 39 gives an option to end the contract. Please remember the option is to end the contract. So if this option is not exercised, then the contract has not ended and it continues. This is something we bear in mind. So let us see how facts come. Situation one, the seller informs the buyer on 3rd of December 22 that he cannot deliver the goods. B assumes that their contract has ended. It says now S has told me that uh, he is not going to supply. So the contract is over. Now what does S do? S brings the goods to B on the 15th of December, which is the agreed date. Is B bound to accept the goods? If B does not accept the goods, can S claim the price? This is the question. And uh, most of us, including lawyers, and definitely most of my students, when I ask them this question, they say that, well, isn't the contract over when S informs that he is not going to deliver goods? Then why should B be bound? B may have purchased them from outside. And then if B doesn't want them, then why should S ask for the money? Why did S bring them at all? And the answer to this goes back to this earlier slide where I said, if one party has refused the perform to perform, the promisee may put an end. He has an option to put it to an end and he must exercise it. So if he has not ended it by giving what we call a termination notice or a rescission, in the contract law, the word used is decision. If he does not do it, then the contract continues. And if the contract continues, then B is bound to accept the goods. It's his obligation to accept. And if B does not accept the goods, S can claim the price. Why? Because he has offered to perform. And B has not taken it. So instead of asking for compensation, he can ask for the price. This is a very important part. And we should remember that. That brings me to this concept of what is a suit for an agreed sum. Before I go to the next situation, let me talk about that. If I owe you money under a loan, then you claim the money on the basis that I have agreed to repay it. So the date has come and I have not repaid. So I should repay. And you are going to force me to pay the amount. So what do you say? Conditions of the loan, therefore pay the amount. An insurance company has agreed that if there is a fire and if there is a loss, then we will pay that amount. So the person who claims that loss is not claiming compensation. He has not suffered a loss because of breach by the insurance company. What he's saying is that ask the insurance company to fulfill what is agreed under the contract. If I am a guarantor, for a loan Vikas Ji has taken and you are the creditor. So when you enforce the guarantee against me, you are actually asking me to fulfill what I have agreed under the contract. So when you ask for amounts, all you are required to show is that I fulfill the conditions for payment of amount and therefore order the other party to pay the amount. There is no question of loss. It is just a question of asking for the money. This is called a claim for an agreed sum. And a very beautiful discussion of this aspect is given in the chapter of remedies in Anson's book on contract law. In the chapter of remedies, you will find a very good discussion about agreed, a claim for an agreed sum. And there is a distinction between this and enforcing compensation is because the calculation of limitation is different. The calculation of court fees is different and so on. So there is considerable difference between a claim for compensation and a claim for, for an agreed sum. Coming back to our example, if B does not accept the goods, S can claim the price because S says there was a contract. It was subsisting. I was supposed to bring the goods on 15th of December. I brought them. And therefore, I can claim the price. Now, why should I know this law? Is because if I want to advise the client at this stage 
or at this stage, then I should be aware of its effect on the actions of the parties, right? So let us go to the next situation. Let us suppose the reverse happens. B informs S on 3rd of December to 2022, don't deliver the goods. This is a refusal by B. Because of this, S has an option to put an end to the contract. But S has not done that. So can S claim the price directly because B has told don't deliver the goods? The answer is no, because he has not performed the based on which his claim will come. He can at that time claim compensation for the loss. B has not taken the goods. I was required to sell them. I suffered a loss, so give it to me. So this, if at all he wishes to claim, he can claim. This is a claim for compensation. Can he attempt to deliver the goods on 15 December 22? Yes, of course, because the contract is not ended. So he can attempt to deliver the goods. And if he attempts to deliver the goods and B does not take, then this is going to be a claim for an agreed sum. I'm talking about remedies, right? At this stage, if he decides to go to court, he can claim compensation. But if he wants the whole amount, right, that can be a matter of strategy, then he cannot claim it unless he has attempted to deliver the goods. So what I mean is, that we must understand the nature of each provision of the law and be able to apply it to the facts of the contract. Now, let us take one more example. Laws affecting, we should also know the laws affecting special contracts. So let us take a situation. A buyer orders goods from S under their contract. S sends them. B rejects them on the ground that they are not fit for his purpose. Can goods be rejected on the ground that they are not fit for the purpose? I'm assuming that they don't have an elaborate written contract. So we go to the Sale of Goods Act. This is the section, section 16. There is no implied warranty or condition as to the fitness for any particular purpose. So no buyer can say that these goods are not fit for my purpose. This is the rule of caveat emptor. But if he has made known to the seller the purpose and if he has relied on the seller's judgment and it's the seller's business to supply the goods, then there is an implied condition that the goods shall be fit for the purpose. This doesn't apply to goods that are sold under a patent or another trade name. So what we say is that if a person wants to reject the goods on the ground that they are not fit for the purpose, he should be able to show this, right? So. If we go back to this example, that he has rejected them on the ground that they are not fit for his purpose, we should be conscious of this 16 and its requirements. What I want to stress is we should understand the niceties and the detailed provisions of the sections which we are going to apply. Then we should also know about the law relating to interest. If parties have written the rate of interest in their contract, well, that can be claimed. If parties have stated there will be no interest payable, then no interest can be claimed. But if nothing is mentioned, then can interest be claimed? This is the question. And we should be conscious that there is another law which governs interest, which is the Interest Act. So can the court allow interest to the parties? Then it says, at which rate, current rate of interest. This is defined in the interest act. If there is a debt payable by a written instrument at a certain time, for example, a loan under a loan agreement or um, a check or a bill of exchange, then from the date when the debt is payable to the institution, current rate of interest can be allowed. Okay. But what if it is some other contract and damages are claimed, etc.? Can it be allowed? It says if the proceedings do not relate to any such debt, such debt means debt payable by virtue of a written instrument. Okay, If it is not relating to such debt, then a written notice is required to claim interest. So I'm if, if I want to claim interest and our contract is silent, I should give you a notice saying I will claim interest and then interest will be given from the notice up to the date of filing the proceedings. 
we all know that interest thereafter is governed by the CPC. And then it says if this doesn't apply if interest rate is agreed or if interest is barred, it is prohibited under the agreement. Our decisions, many of our decisions are based on how much interest can be claimed. So we should be conscious of the provisions of the Interest Act. By the way, um, the Interest Act contains many more provisions about other types of proceedings. Then we should know the laws that affect the particular contract that is regulatory laws, for example. And if we want to enforce, and even if we don't want to enforce, we just want to advise transacting. We say, I'm a convincing lawyer. I'm a transaction lawyer. We cannot ignore the provisions of all these, which are procedural laws. So we must know the law of limitation. We must know that certain transactions require registration. We must know that every agreement requires stamp duty, at least in Maharashtra. People don't pay it, but the law says that it has to be paid. We must know the law of evidence, especially the parole evidence rule. We must know the law relating to jurisdiction in the CPC, and we must know the other provisions in the CPC, right? And this we must know as transaction lawyers. When I was a very young junior, a senior advocate used to say that if you want to practice in the field of contract or transfer of property, you have to be a master of the CPC. Why? Because in a contract, you want to enforce obligations or you want to write enforceable obligations. And in property, you want to enforce a title. Why is the transfer of property there? To give a good title so that it can be defended. And therefore, you must be a master of the CPC. You must know the provisions of the CPC. Then the next thing is we must look at each provision or we must learn to look at each provision from different perspectives. What is the purpose of the provision? We must look at it from the perspective of one party or from the perspective of the other party. So let us look at this provision devolution of joint rights. I am only giving a method of thinking. I've just selected sections which are appropriate for this question. Now the whole question is like this, that uh, let us suppose that um, you are a builder and I and my one brother and one sister have purchased a flat from you. And the last payment is due when you are going to hand over possession. I come with you with the whole payment and I say, give me possession. Should you give it to me? Will you get a discharge? If you give it to me and the others ask you, why did you give possession without our consent? They will draw you into litigation. So you are interested in a discharge, right? So this provision of devolution of joint rights talks about when will a promisee get a discharge? That is the purpose of the provision. So what does it say? When a person has made a promise to two or more persons jointly, so you have made a promise to me that you will hand over possession of the flat, then unless a contrary intention appears on the contract, the right to claim performance rests as between him and them with them during their joint lives. So all of us together must come to you and ask for possession and you can insist that it be so. But if you give it to only one of us, the others have a cause of action against you because this is the default provision. Notice here, we can always put it in the agreement that when the money comes, you can hand over possession to any of us, right? It is, It can be provided. But if it's not provided in the contract, then let us look at it from the promisee's perspective. Who is the promisee? We are the promisees. So from our perspective, I should know that we all must claim possession. Otherwise, at the time of making the transaction, we can make a different provision. If I want to claim possession, I must know that three of us should go. Otherwise, I should know what sort of document to make, a power of attorney or some such document which will give me authority so that I can claim possession. If I know this provision, I will be able to think about it. Look at it from the point of view of the promiser, that is you who is going to give me possession. You have to think that, well, I want to get a discharge. What if others will claim? Then how do I protect myself? 
You can, of course, give me the possession rather than the other two, but you should understand that you are taking the risk. So what I mean is, I go back to my slide and I say that we should learn to look at each provision from the purpose of it or of one party or of the other party. Let me take one more example. This is relating to the law of limitation. We all know that when um, a, a debt, let us say a loan, is barred by limitation, the debt continues, but the right to enforce it is lost. So the remedy is over, but the right remains. Now, what if the loan is time barred? You cannot file a suit to recover it. Then what? If there were an acknowledgement in between, then Limitation Act is there. But nothing is there. The loan date is over. Four years have gone. After that, what? So we have a provision in 25, which is about agreements without consideration. And it says an agreement without consideration is void unless, and this is a provision. And in this case, it is a contract, which means it can be enforced. So what is it? It is a promise. It is made in writing. Signed by the person to be charged therewith means who, who owes the money. What is the promise about? The promise is to pay wholly or in part a debt. And this debt is otherwise fine. It is just that it is barred by limitation. Okay. So if I owe you money and four years are over and I owe you 100 rupees and say today I come to you and I say I promise to pay you 50 rupees of that debt then you can claim from me 50 rupees as if it is a new contract. This is the provision. Now, let us look at it from your point of view. You are the promisee of the debt. So from your point of view, even having that promise is good because otherwise you can't enforce. But you would like to have a promise to pay the whole. And I am the promise, I am the promise sir. I can always say I will pay you only the principal. I will not pay interest. I will pay only half the amount. And I give only that much promise. Right? So, if we are looking at it after the promise is given, then naturally we should know that what is mentioned in the promise only can be recovered. This, this is a way of looking at a provision in great detail. And believe me, this cannot happen in college. So, we can, I never say that students. Why is it that they don't understand so much? It is only after we have seen the world a little bit, you know, two, three years, four years of practice, that we can take every provision. We sit two or three people together and we, we take roles and we are able to discuss the provision. That is the best method of looking at these provisions. So now, let us go to a live case. Live case means things have happened in the past. And today, we have to see what is to be done. But as I take you through the case, I will also take you in that timeline, right? There is one thing we know as practitioners that when a client comes to us, he comes with whatever facts are. We cannot really say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't we can ask the reason why he did something or why he didn't. But you shouldn't have done that, you know, or we wish that wish that facts were different. That is not possible. So we cannot wish away the facts. We have to take them as they are. But is there anything more that we can do? So let us look at that. So a live case means one party has not performed, so we are to decide what action to take. So our decision now is whether to proceed or tell the clients, no, don't proceed. It's a small amount, not worth it. Or do we just give notice? Or do we file action? Or do we file a suit? Or we give notice and wait and then decide whether we file proceedings? This decision is required now. You can, of course, change the decision. Why? Because the tone of what we do is going to change according to our objective. So we need a perspective of the whole case just now. We should know how much we are going to succeed, what course of action to take, so that. Even if the notice is to be drafted, we have to draft it in that manner. You know, I keep saying litigation perspective is not a perspective when you decide to file a suit. Its perspective is required even when you make the contract. But here at this point, we are saying that we are look, we need that perspective so that we know how to draft a notice. So we should have a whole picture, 
we should be able to predict we should be able to anticipate form a judgment please remember your judgment and my judgment can always be different different advocates may give different opinions and this judgment is based on that person's opinion by opinion i mean belief so ultimately we can, can never guarantee our client that he will be successful we say that well if we present the facts in this manner then uh, this will's going to be the outcome so now let me take you to the facts of the case this is a sale of goods case 14th of october 2019 <clears throat> Mr. Buyer of Bangalore, you know B and B, sent an email inquiring of Mr. Seller of Surat about X Y Z X Y Z, a branded product of which Mr. Seller is a wholesaler. You know, the moment I say branded product, then I should say, well, if it's a branded product, then the liability of the seller is really very really small. Okay, so immediately I am thinking of Sale of Goods Act. I am thinking of what remedy. i'm thinking about defense will the other party have and so on so branded products well buyers it's their own decision to buy that product so they know what that product is they should also know whether it will be fit for them or not because they are asking for a branded product 16th october 2019 mr seller emails a quotation for xyz the quotation states 25% advance and balance at delivery payable at surat Now, whatever that means, right? People just write, and uh, when uh, when we have to file a case or we have to fight a case or examine or cross-examine, then we have to put meaning to these words. Balance is payable at delivery, and it's payable at surat. Price includes delivery at buyer's location against a check for the balance. So remember, this is a conditional delivery. Only if you give a check, then only the delivery is going to happen. And then, among other things, the quotation says. that our contract will be subject to surat's jurisdiction only so mr buyer places an order by email for the product for 10000 items at the quoted price and he sends the advance and this is according to contract on 1st of december mr seller sends the good goods and an invoice for 750000 on 3rd of december mr buyer receives them and gives a check for the balance of rupees 750000 so the check is given and the goods are taken we must remember they are branded goods so the only inspection that should happen is whether the goods are of that brand or not maximum whether they are genuine or not but other than that i mean um, there really can be very little to complain about on 7th december 2019 so notice there are five days right three four days 7th december 2019 mr seller deposits the check but on the same day mr buyer sends an email to mr seller that the goods are defective that is not of good quality goods are not suitable for his business you may carry them away okay so now if the goods are branded goods can this be stated is the is the buyer entitled to say that if the goods are branded goods is the buyer entitled to say they are not fit for my purpose that is the language in the sale of goods act and who is supposed to carry them away if the goods are defective is it for the buyer to hand them over to the seller and say here i have brought them or is it for the seller to bring them back from the buyer is it just enough to inform so these are the questions and all these questions have an answer in the sale of goods act on 9th of december the seller comes to know that the check is dishonored so he receives a notice from the bank on 12th of december the seller sends a notice saying your check for 7 lakh 50000 sent for price of goods for this invoice has bounced please send the amount of 7 lakh 50000 notice he doesn't say send the price he says send the amount of check the check was for this purpose send the amount of check the check has bounced send me the amount we will understand the significance of this data 20 December 2019 the buyer writes a reply in three sentences received your notice i am not liable to pay 7 lakh 50 please return the amount of 2 lakh 50000 ah does this mean that the buyer can not now claim compensation is it waiver of the claim for compensation 
this is going to be a question later. And notice here, after almost three years today, 26 November 22, Mr. Seller wishes to file a suit for recovering the amount. So he has come to us. And we must open the file immediately because the first question is limitation. And you will notice that there is very little time. So should we give notice? Should we not give notice? It takes at least two days to prepare the suit or the claim in arbitration and file it. And uh, therefore, a decision has to be taken to, to do something immediately. Okay, so now let us look at an analysis of this. Let us look at the position of the seller. The first question is of time and that is limitation. What is the period of limitation? I'll come, that, come to that shortly. Are there some facts which he doesn't know? And the answer is yes. He doesn't know what is the defect or what is the problem the buyer is talking about. Whether that problem exists. Let us suppose that the notice indicated what it is. But whether it exists or not. Because the goods are still with the buyer. And perhaps the buyer has used them up. So on the one hand he has told him I'm not going to pay. And he has used up the goods. Or has he sold the goods? Because if he has sold the goods then perhaps the seller will be able to claim the price. Now, the next question is where to file the suit? Because, you know, this is very important. This, there is cost involved if the seller in Surat is to go to Bangalore to file a suit. That has, he has to decide then whether to file it or not. So, let us see what are the facts. We all know that a suit can be filed under the CPC where the defendant decides or carries on business, or where the cause of action arose. And generally in respect of cause of action, where the contract was made, or where the contract was broken. There are of course other dates which we can select, but I'm looking at these. So, what is the connection of the contract with Bangalore? The defendant resides there, yes, very well. So the Bangalore court has jurisdiction. The acceptance was posted from Bangalore. Remember the seller sent a quotation and the buyer accepted it by email. I'm using the word posted just to indicate whether the postal rule that I sent the email from Bangalore, therefore acceptance is complete. If it applies to emails, okay, then the contract has happened in Bangalore. So the making of the contract is in Bangalore. But in Surat, what all has happened? The agreement, if it's in writing, may have happened at Surat. The plaintiff resides at Surat. The proposal was emailed from Surat. The acceptance is received in Surat. The payment of was receivable, right? So here is one cause of action, part of cause of action. Payment is receivable in Surat. Check is dishonored in Surat. And I will take you to one more fact here. Twenty-five percent advance, right? Now, if this means that twenty-five percent advance must come with the acceptance, then perhaps we can say that the acceptance is complete only when it is received in surat and not when it is posted. I'm just saying, well, perhaps we can say, and therefore we might say that even if we apply the offer acceptance analysis, uh, well, perhaps we can argue. I'm constantly using the word perhaps because we are still thinking. Perhaps we can argue that, yes, the acceptance has happened at Surah. Now, when we are thinking all this, we should be very conscious of the provisions relating to proposal and acceptance in the contract act. So let us go. So this is about where to file the suit, right? And then we say, well, yes. Perhaps, Mr. Seller, you can file the suit at Surat because we can say that the acceptance is received here and because it's a conditional acceptance. Also because the payment was receivable and the check was dishonored here. So yes, perhaps a part of cause of action is a reason. So let us take a decision that we can file a suit in Surat, right? Now the main question here is, and this is where I want to say that, you know, 
should be conscious of all provisions that might apply. Is do we file a suit on the transaction or do we file it on the check? So what is a suit on transaction? Let us suppose that the check was not given. Goods are delivered and price is payable, let us say after six days. Then how could the seller have asked for the money? He would have said that, look, I this is the contract and it was agreed that goods are to be delivered. So I have delivered them. Here is the delivery salon with the signature and therefore give me the payment. So he alleges that there is a contract and he alleges how he has performed it. And then he says, I have a claim for the money. What we remember is that each of these facts must be pleaded and proved. What are those facts? The transaction itself, how he has performed under the transaction and therefore is entitled to the money. But he has a check. So he can say, forgive the transaction. I will just take the check and the check is dishonored. So like, let me file a suit on the check. So what happens when the suit is on the check? So let us see. First of all, if a suit is to be filed, I'm not talking of a 138 complaint in a criminal court. I'm talking of a suit to recover the amount for which a check was given. So on the check. So if the suit is on the check, then it is a four line suit that for a transaction. So and so gave a check for this amount. I deposited it in the bank, but it has returned dishonored. Hence this suit. Right. So the only cause of action is that the check is dishonored. So what facts are relevant in this suit or in this suit is different. Now, when I was a very young junior, my senior's father, who also was a lawyer, and what shall I say, a lawyer who never wasted words, just the essential should be pleading. That is what he would say. So he used to say, if you remove the title and if you remove the prayer, then the suit should be half a page if it's a suit on a check. So which facts you select is going to be different. And if your suit is on a trans is going to be on a transaction, then your notice must allege the facts of the transaction. If your suit is on the check, then your notice should say you gave a check, it's dishonored, so give me that amount. So your pleadings are also going to be different. The burden of proof, tremendous benefit if you file a suit on a check, right? There's presumption of consideration, there's presumption that it is stamped, and there are so many more presumptions under section 118 of the Negotiable Instrument Act. Now, if I were filing a suit on a transaction, there would be a small burden on me, on the seller, to show that the goods were according to contract, at least an allegation in an affidavit. But if it is, um, if it is a suit on a check, then the question of defective goods need not arise. However, if it's a summary suit, right, I'll come to that. Then the burden will go on the other party to show that the goods are defective. Then a very important decision about whether about this, right, is the question of payment of interest. You will notice that in our contract or in our discussion, there is no agreement about interest. So can interest be claimed? And then we say, yes, under the interest act, it would be 6%, 7%, 8%, current rate of interest as defined. But if it's a negotiable instruments act, then section 80 of the negotiable instruments act says that if you file a suit on a bill of exchange or promissory note, and a check is a bill of exchange, and no interest is mentioned on it, so a check doesn't mention interest, right? Then irrespective of what is agreed between the parties, 18% interest is payable. I just checked up yesterday whether 18 has been amended and it has not. So if I want to claim higher interest, then I should choose this. Right? Next. If I if it's a suit on a check, then a summary suit is maintainable. If the suit is on a transaction and email correspondence, then a summary suit will not be maintainable. And what is the benefit of summary suit? The defendant has to plea or ask that please allow me to defend. 
and then the defendants may be required to prove that the goods were defective. So if I am for S, then I will select this and I will select um, this burden of proof and interest at 18%. But then I ask this question that if a suit on a check is filed, is a notice of demand required? I am not providing an answer. I'm just raising questions. Because if a notice is required, then we have very short time to issue a notice. For that, let us go back. I think I've not mentioned here. There should be one more point here. And that is limitation. So let us go back to the facts. The cause of action for filing a suit arises when there is a breach. So now you will see that the breach has occurred when the check is dishonored, which is 9 December 2019. And that is when the payment was not made, right? So 9 December 19, and now we have 26 November, which is only 10 days. So if a notice is required under the law, then you really have to act fast. If a notice is not required, you still have 10 days to file a suit, which again requires you to act very fast. So these are the ways in which I will ask myself questions and I will answer them while taking a decision. And then in the suit, if I'm filing a suit and even giving notice, which facts are relevant? What is going to be my prayer? And what interest I will be claiming? So what I'm, why I have given this example? This is because one has to be aware of so many things while deciding what to plead, which are the relevant facts I should state. I must state that the goods are delivered. Then how will I show that the goods are delivered? Of course, here the other party has admitted, so proof is not as much required. But every fact which I will narrate to show that I have a contract, this was agreed, this is what I did under the contract, hence I'm entitled to payment. Every fact is going to require proof. We can't anticipate in the beginning that the other party will admit. If the other party admits, that's very really good. But if the other party doesn't admit, then there's a burden of proving facts. So we have to be conscious of every fact, every document affecting it as one goes through the file. Now let us look at the position of the buyer B. Let us suppose the buyer B has received a notice from the seller. So um, when he receives the notice, he has the first opportunity of stating his case. What does he want to say? Is he going to say that the goods are defective? And he will say, can I say that when they are branded goods? I ask for the branded goods. So how far can I apply section 16? I discussed with you section 16 earlier. So how far can I apply? This is something he will have to think about. Because once he puts forward a case, he will not be able to change it later. So he not only has to answer the seller's case, to say that I am not liable, but he also has to set up his own case because what does he want? He will either want compensation for the goods which were not according to contract and he would also at least want back his money. So for that, he has to set up his own case. He will have to show that the goods are defective in order to get back the money, right? So what facts are required for that? Those facts one should be conscious even while replying the notice. He will have to prove that the goods are defective in order to be able to set his own case. So he will have to ask himself, what is the defect? Can I complain that the goods are defective? Or should I say that they are not genuine goods? They are not the genuine brand. So what remains, the what sort of defense will remain if I have asked for branded goods? Will it fall within the implied conditions under the Sale of Goods Act? So we have to bring out the Sale of Goods Act and read it in detail. Now, what about 2,50,000? I have not asked for it. It's barred by limitation, if you can see, or it's very close to limitation. So what if he doesn't file a suit, then I have no opportunity to claim the amount. If he files a suit, I will ask it, perhaps ask for a set-off because counterclaim has to be within the period of limitation. So how do I get that 2,50,000? And can I set off? Let us suppose that the claim of 7,50,000 is awarded. Can I set off the amount I had paid for repair of the goods, can I set it off against the price? So this answer is partly provided in the sale of goods act, but we must know the provisions of set off and counterclaim in the CPC. So can I claim the advance? Will it be the counterclaim? 
What is the limitation for that? It is very short, extremely short. And by saying, return the advance, have I waived the breach? Have I just said it's okay? That's all right. I won't claim compensation. Just give me back my money. Have I done that when I put those words? So here we are interpreting the words of correspondence, which has already happened. And therefore, we have to be conscious of multiple laws, their provisions and principles. And sometimes it's like a game of chess. You put one put forward and you find you have to look at what other provisions are saying. Uh, this, this decision becomes easy if one is more conscious of the laws. I'm not saying we should know every provision of every law, but we should know the possibility or we should have a judgment that there has to be something in the law which I should look out for. Now I come to remedies since we are talking of enforcement. You know, whenever a case for contract comes up, there are two phases. One is the right that is claiming that the defendant should have done something and he hasn't. So I have a right to get the goods. I have a right to have delivery of the goods and so on. And that is the main part. And therefore, because my right is violated or because the defendant has commit, committed breach, what is the remedy I get under the law? So one of the remedies is compensation. Now, the law about remedies is peculiar that the law of remedies doesn't give everything which the plaintiff or the aggrieved party of the contract has suffered. We ask, is he entitled to it? And are there any conditions which must be fulfilled before it is granted? Is it, it, can it be granted in this contract? So a remedy structure does, may not necessarily give the plaintiff everything he wants. Therefore, the plaintiff will have to show his entitlement of the remedy and the defendant may have a defense based on that. We all know, for example, that for the remedy of compensation, the party going to court, so in our case, the seller is going to court, he will have to show that the buyer has broken the contract. He will have to show that this breach has caused me the loss. He will have to show that the loss is caused by the breach. I have suffered the loss and that is because of the breach. And either it has naturally arisen or it was in contemplation of parties. So remote losses are not paid. We know Hadley versus Baxendale, my loss of profits were not paid because the mill had, had stopped. This special circumstance was not known to the carrier and therefore loss of profits, there was no liability for loss of profits. So, while they are in contemplation of parties, and it is under these, right, that we say that a, a plaintiff may have suffered lots of losses because of breach, but he cannot claim all of them. His claim is restricted by this requirement. And then the plaintiff himself cannot just sit down and say, I will sit and claim loss. He should, he should have taken steps to mitigate or to reduce that loss. This is the third paragraph in section 73. So a plaintiff comes with a case first that I have a contract and then his case may either be I have performed it and give me the agreed amount. So he'll have to show the contract. He will have to show his performance and therefore he has a right to claim the money. He may say I have performed, I'm ready to perform. So compel the other party to perform. And then we ask, well, are all the conditions for the grant of specific performance fulfilled? He may say there is a breach, I've suffered a loss, so give me compensation. And then we have to say, well, are the requirements of 73 fulfilled? He says breach, loss, give me liquidated damages. And the law of liquidated damages is, is in such a state that he will be required to prove his loss. And if his loss is more than liquidated damages, well, he will get only the amount of liquidated damages. So the law is at such a state that one must be very clear as to what all proof is required, proof of which facts is required if one has a claim for liquidated damages. His case may be that the other party has committed breach, but the other party has collected under my bank guarantee. So because he has committed breach and he has collected the amount, return to me the amount which he has collected under the bank guarantee. He might say, well, the other party has committed breach. So all I want is return the advance to me. Sometimes 
the case, the contract has become void, for example, because of impossibility. And then he says, well, the contract has become void, but whatever I have worked, I should get paid. So he claims for the work done. And sometimes he says, well, I have avoided the contract. So whatever benefit is there, give it back to me. There are, of course, many other types of claims. But what I wish to stress is that in each of these cases, a different set of facts are going to be important. So we have first to decide what sort of case is mine so that we are able to select the facts. And this is one more remedy that there was a breach by the other party. I gave notice. I got it completed from a third party. And so my claim is for expenses under section 20 of the amended specific relief act, which is a claim for substituted performance. Now the defendant comes with a case, he might say I have no contract or he may say I have not committed breach, I have performed or I have offered to perform. Then he has to bring facts, state those facts and he has to prove those facts that he has performed so he is not liable. He may come with a case where he is entitled to a defense under the substantive provision of contract law. So he may say there is no contract. He may say it is void because there is no consideration, because uh, there is a mistake. He may say that the contract is voidable and I have avoided it because the consent is not free or because the other party has committed breach under section 39, that is refusal. 53, that is he has prevented me from performing the contract. And 55 is that there is a failure and time is of the sense. Or he may put up a case that, well, we substituted a new contract or we changed its terms. So I am not bound under what the plaintiff says. Or he may say together we have cancelled the contract. Okay. Or he may say that the plaintiff himself dispensed with or remitted or extended time. It's under 62. This is 63. Or he may say that the contract has become void. Right. Because it was contingent or because there is an impossibility. And again, he has to decide what will be the basis of his claim. And he will have to bring uh, facts and prove those facts accordingly. He might say that there is a material alteration. That the document relating to my contract was with the other party. And the other party has made changes in it without my permission. In which case, the claim under that document does not lie. But he may also have defenses relating to the provisions of remedies. So if a claim of compensation is made against him, then his defense will be, well, plaintiff has not suffered a loss. Plaintiff has not proved any loss. No loss was caused by the breach, but the loss was caused because of some other factor. Yes, there was a loss, but what did the plaintiff do to bring it down? He has not fulfilled his duty. And there is a loss, but, well, I did not know that this loss would arise. It was not in contemplation of parties, so I'm not liable. If it's a suit for specific performance, we all know that after 2018, specific performance is no longer exceptional. It's no longer discretionary. Anyone who wants can get it. But there are still defenses where the defendant says the plaintiff was not ready and willing, 16, that the contract is of a personal nature or the contract requires constant supervision. So don't enforce. Then if the claim is for rescission under the specific relief act, one of the defenses can be that status quo ante cannot be restored. So don't grant that remedy. So now I come to the end. What is the conclusion? First of all, to have a litigation perspective, we should know the laws. We should be aware of the interaction of the laws and the different provisions within each law. We must appreciate the importance of facts. And by that I mean acts. Acts means actions. Statements, events and conducts. So we should be aware of the importance of these in not just the written contract, but all these things during uh, proving our case. We must be conscious that we cannot change the facts. But we but we can interpret conduct, right? Then we have to choose the facts. Now, here is a problem that when we see the facts, then we will say which legal provision to apply. So in our example, we say there is a check. So let us file a suit on a check. 
but it is the legal provision which decides the relevant fact. So if I'm going to file a suit on a check, then we say, okay, has it dishonored? What is the letter the bank has given? Because that fact assumes importance. So these two things actually work in circles. And even though the facts come as they are, we are always able to interpret the facts. So here is some litigation perspective. As I said, I've only raised questions and I've given a method of thinking. I am not a established litigation advocate. I am a teacher and I fulfill my role as a teacher in making you think. So thank you very much. It was wonderful to share my views with you. If there are questions, I'll be able to answer them. Shall I stop my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. As usual, the session was wonderful. Words cannot express the way you have simply made people understand. Um, this is by Akshay. He says, breach under section 39 and 55 is a ground to avoid contract. Would that not blur the distinction between termination of a contract and a decision of a contract? Yeah. The Contract Act allows termination for breach. Termination, I'm using the word um, which we use as lawyers. The words used in uh, these 39, 53, and 55 is he may put an end or it will be avoidable at his option. And uh, it's a very old Privy Council case which says that although the words used in uh, Section 39 are uh, put an end to the contract, it means that the contract must be rescinded. So rescission, that is cancelling the contract by the action of one party, is possible under the Contract Act only under Sections 39, 53 and 55. 39 is where one party says, I will not perform, I don't wish to refuse or disables himself from performing. Uh, 53 is where I want to perform, but you prevent me from performing. Then I have to end it. I can't say the contract is over. I have to end it. And the third is 55, where failure means the date has come and there is no performance. But the right of termination is dependent on one more factor. Uh, was, was it the intention of the parties that time was of these sense? And in all these cases, the contract continues unless it is terminated by the other party, that is the party who is aggrieved by the breach. So yes, in contract law uses the word rescission. We use the word termination. So when we give a notice, we say I am terminating because you have refused to perform. Um, uh, what is the difference between a claim for damages under Section 73 and indemnification? These days we are seeing indemnification clauses for damages arising from the breach of contract. Is indemnification clauses relevant here? Does in indemnification clause cover indirect consequential damages as it is believed so? Right. To indemnify means to save a person from loss. So if you give me a contract where my client has to sign an indemnity, I will not want to. Because when I say indemnity, I am saying, well, whatever loss you suffer, whatever expenses you suffer, Paisa for paisa, I will pay. This is indemnity. Of course, you will have to prove the loss. But the requirement of 73, which is contemplation of parties, or which is loss caused by the breach, well, does not apply. And uh, very often, uh, indemnity clauses are made to cover even litigation expenses and legal expenses, which in compensation may not be considered. So in compensation, it is subject to the provisions of 73, right? But indemnity is a promise and a promise under indemnity is a claim for an agreed sum. It has to be ascertained, but it's still a claim for an agreed sum. So a person who claims under an indemnity says that, look, this is the condition and uh, that condition is fulfilled and this is my loss. Now the court may say this is not your loss. So out of 100, probably the court may come to a conclusion that 59 is your loss. 59 will be paid. It's a claim for an agreed sum. So if I am giving indemnity, first of all, I would not want to give it. Second is even if I give, I should be very clear about um, what sort of expenses it will cover. And uh, I would like to put a limit on it because otherwise it is unlimited.
and there are contracts where you come across indemnity and indemnity will not cover consequential losses i mean once i decide to give you indemnity what all it should cover will be negotiated between you and me so and how do you define that they say that this contract is against the public policy how will you define public policy and then saying that it runs teat to the public policy in uh, in terms is, of section 23 of the contract act yes even if a law even if there is an earlier judgment saying that a certain type of contract is against public policy i will still attempt to enforce it because the concept of public policy changes and perhaps what was considered against public policy 50 years ago may not be true today the law is not that contracts against public policy are void unlawful but the law is that a contract uh, an agreement is unlawful if the court considers it as against public policy and the concept of public policy that is uh, i think uh, public policy cannot be defined i will not go into how it has been described in different ways but basically the question is that should this activity be encouraged and if it should not be encouraged then the court should stop enforcing it you know this is the thought behind public policy from a litigation perspective what extent is the limitation of liability enforceable what can be limited what cannot be can there be certain discussion on this aspect we are actually entering into what is transactive but that's all right uh, parties can just see parties are free to decide anything so if you and i have a contract and we can very well agree that yes i will be liable to only up to the price of the contract i can say i will be liable only up to 1 lakh rupees or i can say i will be liable for 10000 rupees which is liquidated damages or i can say i will not be liable at all which is exclusion clauses so parties are free to decide so they may put a limit on liability if there is a limit on liability it means that the loss should still be proved but beyond that limit it cannot be collected this is by amar uh, section 27 of the specific relief act we find the use of the phrase voidable or terminable rescission in law is understood to cancel the very uh, origin and form formation of the contract is it right usually the word rescission is used where you can rescind under the terms of the contract and terminable is where it is at the option of one party usually under the terms of the contract i'm sorry rescission under the contract law and termination under the contract if if you go to the books on specific relief act the commentaries or uh, they have discussed uh, why the two words are used you may also like to go to the law commission report after which the specific relief act claim uh, came and you will find a discussion about why the two words are used um uh, one is asking could you please explain the part about claiming of interest as per the enactments as referred earlier the interest act please go to section 3 i think it was just let me check it is section 3 of the interest act uh, there are other sections which deal with fraud trusts etc so do read it's a small act but the sections are very long and the interest act says that first of all can a person claim interest in respect of a contract and the answer is that first of all look at the contract if the contract provides a rate of interest then it can be claimed if the contract clearly says that there will be no interest then interest cannot be claimed or if the contract doesn't specify anything if it's a debt on a written instrument it can be claimed from the day the amount was payable what which rate of interest the current rate of interest there's a definition of current rate of interest in the act maybe one court may say it is 7.5 another court may say it's 7.25 it has it can be shown with reference to uh, circulars of the rbi but if it's not a debt on a written instrument then it can be claimed only after notice is given so a party has to give a notice saying i will claim interest at this rate and then only he can claim it and the court will grant only the current rate of interest this is section 3 and there is lots of commentary under section 3 so you can go to a book on interest act and read it or look at case law under it 
Um, Ira says that it is a delight to hear you, your lecture after many years since law college and looking forward for more sessions from you. Thank you. Um, this is... This is, uh, why does... Are these questions on chat? Shall I open chat? No, ma'am. Uh, what they are doing is Akshay is sending it to me privately. Okay. It says, why okay. does the Specific Relief Act in Section 27 refer to the phrase voidable or terminal when the contract act does not make any uh, reference to concept of termination? Can you explain Section 27 precision in detail and how does it play out in a litigation? Section 27... Yes, uh, I mean, I discussed just now what is uh, voidable and what is terminable. Uh, term terminable means a party has the power to bring it to an end. It can be terminated. Mm. As regards rescission, the, it is a remedy. So you can go to court and say rescind means very usually it is rescinded by giving a notice and then you ask for a declaration that the rescission is valid. The prayers may vary. And if you go to the uh, CPC, there are forms in uh, giving prayer, uh, giving the planes. And in those planes, you can read up those prayers. So the thing is that it is not at all necessary to file a suit for rescission. Because all that the contract law requires is that you communicate. So if I say that my contract was caused by undue influence, it is enough if I give a notice saying I avoid, I rescind, I terminate the contract. Right? That is enough. And that ends the contract. And I can actually get back my money. But why is a decree required? Let us suppose that I have gifted property and I'm challenging it on the basis of undue influence. I will challenge it. But no, the gift will not be undone. Remember, gifts are registered. So the gift will not be undone by the authorities unless I have a decree. So if I want a decree, if I want relief. So I will rest in and I want back the money. Then I may be required to go to court. So whenever a suit for rescission is filed, it can either claim rescission or it can claim a declaration that the contract is validly rescinded. This is an aspect which you can read up in commentaries. Before I take the next question, I will just read a few of your students have joined. Priyanka Kulkarni says, ma'am, happy to attend your session. And it is amazing as usual. And then Ashwarya says, it's almost after seven to eight years I'm hearing you after leaving ILS College. It's always a pleasure to hear you. Indeed, a great session. We can only endorse those, those who are watching us virtually on the YouTube as well. Uh, that's true. It resonates with them. And ma'am, normal question is, one has just sent me a text. Uh, what do you mean by when we write that time is the essence of the contract? Yes. It's time of the essence. Basically, Parties must perform at the specified time. And uh, this is not given in the contract that, that you must perform in the specified time. I'm sorry, my mobile phone fell down. Yeah. It is not given in the contract that, that you must perform. There's a general obligation that parties must fulfill their obligation or they must perform what they have agreed. It is on this basis that we say that uh, parties must perform at the specified time. Now, if someone has not performed at that time, has he committed breach? The answer is yes. And let us suppose that he performs after a delay. Can compensation be claimed because of the delay? The answer is yes. That was the that was the claim in Hadley versus Baxendale. And if uh, the special circumstances were made known to the carrier, then the carrier would have got that compensation. So, delay is the breach. And for that breach, if there is a loss, then that loss can be claimed. So, Section 55, what is the essence of it? You know, I mentioned to you that we must understand the essence of what is the purpose of each provision. The purpose of time of essence provision in 55 is, can I terminate simply because you have failed to perform? What is meant by termination ending? Why would I want to terminate? Because I want to end our relationship so that I'm free to buy from outside or I'm free to sell outside. I am free from this contract because I can look for other options and I'm no longer bound under it. So even if the seller were to deliver goods, I should be able to say, no, I will not take them because you failed. But can I say that only if I have terminated? So our question is, 
that can there be termination just because somebody has failed? And my answer is yes, if the contract provides. But if the contract doesn't provide, what does the contract act say? Now, when I say contract provides, there are conflicting judgments about this. So I'm, that's why I said I'm not getting into case law because every judgment is based on the peculiar facts of each case. So now, what if the contract is not stating it? Then can there be termination because one party has failed to perform? First of all, one party failing to perform does not end the contract. Can the other party end it? And the answer is that only if time is of essence. And the word is not whether time is of essence. The wording is if it is the intention of the parties that time is of essence. So the court will have to see in each case whether time is truly of essence or not. And that is where we say, okay, look, what do they say? Do they say time is of essence? Very good. If they have said it, then they think time is important. But then the same contract also is saying that if there is a delay, then 1,000 rupees per day will be paid. And naturally, time is not important because they have made provision for delay. So stating time of essence, again, does not carry meaning. I would put it like this, that in a contract, it is worth saying that time is of essence. It can be said that time is of essence for this obligation and the other obligation you can keep quiet. There's no harm in stating time is of essence. But whether it is truly of essence or not, really, the matter is really about termination. Mm. Sagar Salumke says it was a wonderful attending your lecture after 23 years. Oh, good. It's good that students remember us even after 23 years. Okay. It's a famous saying, Guru Govind, Tau Khade, Kake Lagu Pai, Vali Hari Guru, Aap yes. Guru Govind, Diyo Batai. And they say that Gurus are the right, to take us to the right light. And this yes. is Nitya who says, can a suit for specific performance of a one-time settlement be filed against a bank for enforcement? Uh, I didn't get the whole question. I think just a minute. Just please give me a minute. My... Yes, can you give the question, please? Um, uh, can a suit for specific performance of a one-time settlement be filed against a bank for enforcement? Yes, it can be. Because the law, law is now so simple... I, of course, I assume that there is no arbitration clause, but the law and arbitrators can grant specific performance. But the law is very simple. If you want specific performance, you ask for it. But what is it that you want to ask? And can that be enforced by the court? That is the question. You will have to, he or she will have to read the Sardar Associates and latest judgment of Justice Emma Shaw on the OTS yes. on the bank's policy. Right. Uh, there's one more student who has appreciated you before we part for a day. It says, uh, Kulkarni, thank you, ma'am, for the amazing session. We are the current students of ILS and we keep looking forward for your session. So we can only thank say you. that they can connect with you on the LinkedIn for the latest updates of all the sessions, not only on the Beyond Law, but even otherwise. Yes, thank you. So uh, thank you, ma'am, for your amazing session as usual. It was spot on. And we believe that we will continue this knowledge sharing on this platform. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay blessed. And tomorrow we have a session uh, on the English polishing grammar, the use of apostrophes, what is the significance by Mr. Vasant Patwardhan. So do stay connected with us tomorrow at 6 p.m. Thank you, ma'am, once again, on behalf of the team of Beyond Law CLC and all your students and the students of law who are always learning from your knowledge sharing. Thank you. Namaste. Can I leave?